What's up, everyone, and welcome to the Long Game Podcast, hosted by Thomas Kopelman and Jacob Turner. In each episode, you'll hear us break down financial topics that are relevant to you and your situation. Our goal is to help bring credible financial information to you in short, bite-sized episodes. All opinions expressed on this show are for educational, informational, and entertainment purposes only. Nothing on the Long Game Podcast should be considered advice. Always consult with your team of professionals before making any decisions regarding your finances. All right, what is up and welcome back everyone to another episode of the Long Game Podcast. I'm your co-host Thomas Coleman here with me, Jacob Turner. Jacob, how you doing, man? I'm good, man. We just had the draft uh, yesterday, so it's been a little bit of a whirlwind for some of our guys, but uh, exciting times. How about you? That is super exciting. Um. I'm doing well. I just came off a weekend wedding. I was in a wedding for one of my good friends. Still recovering, long, tired weekend, but excited to jump in the topic today and talk a little bit about health insurance, HSAs, and FSAs. Um, And so the reason why I thought this would be a good topic is, you know, sometimes I feel like I talk about this on Twitter all the time, right? HSAs, how to best use them, how to invest them, why not to expend them, and all this stuff. And then I realized I talked with all these prospects and none of them are doing this right. And so before we really dive into specifically HSAs, I think we do need to talk about what the options are and what health plans um, actually allow it. So with health insurance, you basically either have high deductible health plans or not. If you don't have a high deductible health plan, then that means that you basically have an FSA. Some places also have HRAs, which are like health reimbursement accounts. They can work really similarly, but with FSAs, it's very different than an HSA. So when you go select your health plan, uh, you know you don't want to pick just based on one of these two things. I think oftentimes you'll see people, you know, we're trying to learn about finance. We read about HSAs on social media. Great, I'm going to go pick the HSA eligible plan. But before you do that, you really do need to understand your own family's needs and your own family's care. So for a lot of people with you know maybe less income, less wealth, low deductible plans might be more beneficial, especially when you have either young kids, you either have some health condition that warrants a lot of expenses. Because at the end of the day, right, there are some HSA eligible plans that could be a deductible of, or you know, let's say eight, ten thousand dollars, right? And if for you that's not something that you could really handle well, it might make sense to go down to a plan that might have a one thousand dollar deductible or or two thousand dollar deductible. So I think all of this does always start with the need that we have, the income that we have, the tax bracket you have does matter. But if you pick an FSA eligible plan, then it's a little bit harder to figure out what to put in than an HSA eligible plan. The reason that is, is that most times what you put into an FSA has to be used in this calendar year. So this year, it's basically 3,200 that you can put in single single, or 6,400 that you can put in married. And so think about that, right? You have to have quite a bit of health expenses to end up going through $6,400 in an FSA. And so a lot of times what I help clients do is let's look at previous years. You know, if we have an FSA eligible plan, what is the amount that we're spending? And then what amount can be carried over? Some plans at zero. I think the highest I've ever seen is about $1,000. So you don't want to get in the habit of, oh, I put in 6,400 bucks. We spent 1,500. Gosh, now I have to figure out how to spend $4,900, right? You could potentially look into braces or glasses or there's certain like, you know, goods and things that you can buy that are FSA eligible. But in general, you don't want to focus on putting in too much there because so many get excited about it because of the tax benefits, right? The the tax benefit is it's pre-tax. You get to spend pre-tax on health expenses. But if you don't have those health expenses, you end up spending on things that you don't need, or you potentially end up losing those dollars. So, you know, Sometimes you can fund it throughout the year. If they allow it, sometimes you have to set it at the beginning of the year. That's more rare, but FSAs are like fine. You know, I I think it's something that you might as well use if you know you have expenses. So, hey, kid's going to have braces this year. It's going to be three grand. Okay, well, then let's put that and maybe a little bit more into the FSA. But you don't want to just like guess and put too much in and then be in a situation where you're like, well, what do I do with these leftover funds? Yeah. I think this comes back to something that I was having a conversation with somebody about this today, actually a client, and we were talking about potentially doing something to save money in taxes. And the, we were talking about a donor advised fund, but the same thought applies here. I think oftentimes people will see a strategy and we'll use HSA as an example. 
you know, there's triple tax advantage. The money that you put in goes in, you get the tax deduction, it grows tax-free, and then it potentially comes out tax-free if you use it for those healthcare expenses. So people see that and they say, well, I definitely want to do that. But I think, Thomas, to your point, we first and foremost have to understand, like, what is the situation that you are in personally? And then what are your health insurance options? Because a lot of people say, like, well, I want to do an HSA and everything else aligns, but maybe they're at an employer that doesn't have a high deductible plan that they could be on. And they don't quite understand that. Or they're in a situation where if they had the big healthcare expense come up, they'd be better off just paying a higher premium and just having the lower deductible than having to really bite the bullet and pay a huge amount out of pocket. So while the HSA can be really valuable, and I'm a huge proponent of it, I've been doing it for a few years now, and I'm trying to use it as like this long-term retirement plan and never spend it and just kind of see what happens with it. But I think it ultimately always comes back to what is the client trying to accomplish and then backdating that and saying, okay, if we're trying to accomplish that, what are the best strategies for us to have in place from that point on? Totally. And I think, you know, one misconception I see, you know, talking on the HSA side of things is the average person thinks that because you're picking an HSA eligible plan that you will be spending more. But time and time again, when we do this analysis for clients, we review it every single time. You know, what is deductible? What is out of pocket max? What are premiums? A lot of times people forget about premiums, right? So an HSA eligible plan, a lot of times is going to be cheaper because it's going to come with a higher deductible. In, in 2024, the annual deductible has to be at least $1,600 for self-only coverage and $3,200 for family coverage. So it's really not super high, but what what often happens is we'll see low deductible plan, you know, the top of the line plan might end up costing, you know, a few hundred to high hundreds more per month. And so when you factor in what ends up being better, you have to think about, you know, how much do we typically spend? What is the amount of the deductible? Then what does it cover after that, right? Is it, you know, you have to pay 80%, you have to pay 90%, you have to pay 20%, you know, look through all of those numbers to be able to make the, the right decision. and it's a guess, right? Like I think the best way to do it is look at the last couple of years. Do you spend a lot or maybe do you have new life events, right? Did you just have a baby? Um, did, you know, did you previously not have kids? So you guys spent no money and now you're going to make sure your kids go and, you know, the mom wants to go do more and get checked up on more. You know, that's the situation where you do want to reassess the plan that you pick, but HSAs are super advantageous. And the biggest mistake I see people make is spending them in this calendar year. And the reason that I think this is a big mistake is that I think in so often in finance, people really get caught up on the deduction and what it saves you in the deduction when most times tax-free growth is actually going to be the biggest benefit, right? Yep. We see it in 529s, but with HSAs, it's really interesting. So it's pre-state, it's pre-fed. There's a couple states like New Jersey and California where this is not exactly the same on the state level, but you basically get to go both of those and you get to go pre-FICA tax. So for most high earners, that's not going to benefit you, you know, the full 7.6%, but that's still a pretty big benefit, right? You could be 37%, you could be in a high state tax state, and you could end up getting anywhere from bottom end 20% to all the way up to maybe a 50% deduction. And that's great, right? 8,300, um, dollars, you end up getting this deduction in California or, you know, high state tax state, you might end up saving about four grand on taxes. That's nice. But what ends up being impactful is that you let those get invested for 30 years and then you get to use them tax free. And so when clients ask me like, you know, what should I do with my HSA? My answer is pretty much always don't use it right now. Just invest yeah. it. Do not use it let it grow and pay for these expenses out of cash. And for most high income people like we work with, they max out all of the tax advantage accounts really, really quickly. And they're left over with after tax dollars. They can either take the HSA benefit of growing tax free, or, you know, they can use that. And at the end of the day, I would much rather that grow tax free. And the other great part about it is I could spend 10 K on healthcare this year and I could reimburse myself 10 years down the line for this year expense in this year, as long as I keep receipts and I can prove it. So if you think about it, like a backup emergency fund in the way that like that HSA money is always accessible to the amount tax free of the receipts that you have, why would you choose to use that over cash when you can let that grow? Yeah, I think there's so many ways to to maximize it. But I think just at the starting level, I think one thing that people miss is you see this a lot even with 401ks. People think, oh, I contributed to my 401k. But you still have to invest the money inside your 401k. And HSA is the same way. 
you know, we're talking about HSAs and HSA is an account. It's not an investment, it's an account. So when the money goes in there, you need to make sure that you're also investing that money. Now, typically, depending on where your HSA is, there could be some sort of restrictions on what you can and can't invest in. Oftentimes, it's like a 401k where there might be some Rolodex of funds you can invest in. I do know at some places like Fidelity, you can invest in essentially whatever you want in the public markets with your HSA. But Thomas, I think to your point, understanding how to best utilize the HSA, once you understand like, hey, if, if this is the route that I could go, I have enough money to be on a high deductible plan. I also have enough money to potentially contribute the max to this HSA. If I'm going to go that route, what is the best goal for this money in the future? Because oftentimes that person, like you mentioned, doesn't need the money today and they might not need it in the next five years. So what does it look like and how are we investing it? The way I often think about it is the way that I'm investing my HSA is very similar to how I'm investing my Roth IRA, right? I'm saying, hey, this is going to be tax-free money in the future. Yes, I'm not going to be using it probably for the exact same things I'm going to be using my Roth IRA for in the future. But at the same time, I think to your point, being able to keep those receipts and being able to go back if you if you have a decent way of doing it, and the reality is most of the medical bills now are paid online. So you, we're not talking like you need to have paper receipts, but even if you had a Dropbox or something that you can have on the cloud where you're just tossing every receipt in there, or at least bigger ones that come up, you spend a thousand dollars on something, toss it in there because you never know, then you have the accessibility of the money. The other thing that I would say is, I think particularly interesting for people that we work with, you know, for high earners, let's say you're 30 years old and you just started having a family, I know for me, before I had kids, I mean, I almost never went to the doctor. So I didn't even really think about health insurance. Now that I have four kids, I think about health insurance a lot more because the reality is one, they're sick a lot more often than we're sick. They're just normal visits and they go in, but also, you know, my son's broke his wrist twice this year. And there's things that come up where you, you don't really think about that when you're single and you're on your own. Oftentimes those things, those events don't happen quite as much, but now with kids, they do happen. So I think it's an, it's always important to understand like, where am I trying to go? What is the best coverage for me? And then if the best coverage for you has the HSA option, making sure you understand how am I actually maximizing that HSA option? Yeah. I think you made a bunch of great points there. And I think, you know, the part about the investment focus is really important because I, I see this where people are like, oh, you know, I'm investing my HSA because I understand the benefit of that. And then you look at how it's invested and it's in like bonds or very, very conservative portfolio. When at the end of the day, if you're investing that, the goal is that this is a retirement vehicle, but a retirement vehicle that's going to be used really on healthcare expenses, which you know any financial planner is going to tell you is going to be one of your top two to three expenses. And I think the other part about it too is that people fail to realize how many things are HSA eligible. And so somebody on Twitter earlier this late week was like, I get the idea of this, but like, after how many years is this not really a good strategy where I end up with too much money? And my answer was like, I don't think that there's a, a number at all, right? Because it's, you know, dental care, mental health expenses, emergency medical expenses, family planning products, uh, you know, women's products, uh, common or routine medical expenses, you know, vision care. And then there's all these other, you can pay for long-term care insurance. And then there's just all these products and other things that you can buy some places like massage therapy is, et cetera. So at the end of the day, like I think I would be doing this, I would be paying out of cash flow, I would take this tax free growth. And you know, the worst thing that happens is it's another, you know, pre tax account, like an IRA, if you really did have leftover funds. But you know, I haven't really seen that end up being a thing in in practice. I think the other thing that you mentioned is sometimes I see people that their investments are not great, because they are limited in the options that they have. And one of the best things about HSAs is unlike 401ks, you can roll out your funds on a yearly basis, monthly basis. You know, I would never recommend somebody every month go roll this out to get to a, a new investment. But I think one time per year, it, there's a great opportunity to say, hey, I don't like my investment options. I'm going to roll this to Fidelity. I'm going to invest it in you know, exactly what I want to invest in. Fees are really low and let that grow for as long as possible. Yeah, I think it's, it's just really interesting oftentimes what I see is people understand maybe the basics of something. They maybe read a post that me or you wrote on Twitter about HSAs and they're like, oh, I want to do that. And maybe they set it up and they either don't do it right or they don't quite realize, like, maybe I don't have the plan that allows me to set that up. Or even if they do do it, they get to they get past step one. Step two is actually investing the money. And then step three is understanding, like, when I'm actually going to use this money, how am I going to use it? I know some of our most recent conversations on this podcast have been around, you know, saving money is great, but at some point we need to understand how we're going to spend it. And I think part of that spending conversation comes into how are we going to spend from certain types of accounts and how are we earmarking these different types of accounts for future spending 
in the future. And that's where I always think it's important. Like the tax benefits are great. It's an incredible account. It's personally one of my favorite accounts, but that's because it works well for me and what I'm trying to do in the future. And that's why I just encourage everybody listening, make sure that any of the things that we're talking about, like it has to make sense for what you're trying to accomplish in your life. And just because it's a great option doesn't mean it's a great option for you. Yeah. So true. I, I don't think there's anything there I can disagree with. I think, you know, maybe one of the last points to make is understand that if you want it to be pre FICA, it has to be through payroll. So a lot of times I see people, they're like, well, Hey, why don't I just not go through payroll? Cause I don't like this investment option. Why wouldn't I just go through fidelity? And the reason is, is that you, it's not pre FICA taxes if you do it that way. So again, for somebody over the social security wage base, not that impactful, like 2.9% difference. If that seems easier to you, just one time fund it per year. But if you are under social security wage base, it is really impactful because you get the self, the full self-employment tax deduction, which can add to be quite a bit, but yeah. I think, you know, HSA, FSA wise, just to kind of summarize, you know, you basically, depending on your health plan, you get to pick. I think a lot of times people are just like, oh, I want to use an HSA. And they don't realize that you have to have a health plan that qualifies and not every health plan that is over the deductible amount does qualify. So you want to make sure of that FSA is really use it or lose it. You can put a lot in, but make sure you understand what can be carried forward and what your estimated expenses are. And then also looking to see if, can you just add to it throughout the year? So if a big expense pops up and you know, it's going to be coming, can you just add more to the FSA? You know, I see sometimes you can do that. Sometimes you can't. And then on the HSA side, understand again, you have to have a health plan that allows it, you know, as long as you're able to do this, putting into an HSA, getting the tax deduction, getting the tax-free growth, saving those receipts, and then using that way down the line. And as a backup emergency fund, if you ever get in a tough spot and you need to reimburse yourself is a good option. But understand if it's long-term money, you need to invest according to that goal. If for you, it's like, hey, I get this, but just in case I need in a few years, I want to have it be stable, then you know, maybe part of it is really conservative and part of it as growth. But for most places, they do have a minimum of like five hundred, a thousand, or two thousand dollars that you need to keep in an HSA in cash that cannot be invested. So if you see that, don't don't feel like that's a weird thing that is very common. And if the investment options are bad, know that whenever you want, you can roll it to a fidelity and get it invested. And a lot of times, it really does make sense to do that um, when you are limited, or some just you don't have the ability to invest in general. Anything else you want to add? No, I think that really hit it. I, I think that the takeaway for me is there's really good accounts here. And a couple of things, one, things can change over time. Like what you do for health insurance and how you make contributions to an FSA or an HSA can change as you continue to progress in age and income and dependence and all those things. And secondarily, just making sure that you understand like, what is the goal that I'm doing with this money? How am I best maximizing and not just doing step one, but doing step one, two, and three. And then understanding, even if I do step three, what does it look like for me potentially spending this money in the future? Totally. And one thing I actually just realized I forgot to mention is that a lot of times I see that companies give HSA matches. So make sure when you're calculating and trying to figure out what plan is right for you, that you do take that into consideration because that might cover a decent amount, but also understand that the yearly limit is reduced by that amount. So if it's 8,300 and they're matching a thousand, you can't do 8,300 plus the thousand even though like in a 401k, those are two separate limits. And in HSA, the combination is the annual limit. And that's something I see people mix up all the time. But everybody, we appreciate you listening. Um, again, please rate and subscribe. And if you have any topics, make sure to send them over to us. We would love to do some that are specific to the audience. But until next week.